if it's all right with you, I would like to to start uh, this discussion by um, setting the stage, metaphorically speaking. Um, because by August 1027, Normandy had been in existence for just over a century. Um, a county founded by Norse invaders the, um, turned settlers had grown into a duchy. Uh, its ruler, however, Richard III, was now dead. He had been duke for uh, less than a year. Uh, could you please give us a brief overview on the status quo in Normandy at this time? This was probably a low ebb for Normandy, at least in the recent period. Uh, they had had several very strong dukes in a row, uh, but then uh, the, ro the rule of Richard uh, was beset by uh, rebellion from his younger brother. Uh, and so that brief year that he was duke uh, was a really fractious one. Uh, and then when he died suddenly, uh, Robert took over, and there were later rumors that Robert had helped his brother along, uh, that he had in fact poisoned him. Now, there's no evidence for this. It's a later story, and anyone who died suddenly was subject to a rumor that they'd been poisoned. So there's lots and lots of rumors about poisoning in the Middle Ages. Probably most of them were not, in fact, um, uh, anything illicit. Uh, but this did dog uh, Robert's reputation a, a little bit. Uh, so he takes over slightly under a cloud. Uh, and he also has a, an irregular personal life, right? So he is not married. Uh, he has not made a high status marriage, which certainly would have helped him politically. Uh, so uh, he's only Duke for a very brief period, uh, no more than eight years. And in that time, he only manages uh, to produce an illegitimate son. Uh, so he has not actually done the best he can for the duchy by providing uh, for the succession in a more secure way. Uh, uh, but in 1034, he goes off on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And this was a risky move. Uh, it was something that a lot of European rulers were doing at the time. Uh, so uh, a number of other uh, French noblemen, in fact, had, had done this, Counts of Anjou had gone on pilgrimage. Uh, but uh, it was a risky thing to do. Before he left, he got the major nobles of the duchy to agree to accept his illegitimate son, William, as his heir. Now, this wasn't completely out of bounds because the question of legitimacy in this period was a little bit up in the air. We're talking about a transition period in uh, mores, in views of marriage, uh, whether someone had to be born in legitimate church-sanctioned marriage or not to inherit uh, an estate or a kingdom or a duchy or whatever, that was not completely set in stone yet. The church was just starting to really try to push through its rules on marriage with regard to a couple of things. One, on legitimacy, right? That you have to actually get married with the official sanction of the church um, and also indissolubility. So you could only have one wife and then you know that that's what you had until that uh, marriage was dissolved by death. Um, so the church was starting to make inroads there, but it hadn't completely uh, made its, its will known. So it was plausible that William could have been succeed, you know, successful in taking the duchy. Uh, but there was also a door open to a subsequent legitimate marriage by Robert if he returned safely from pilgrimage. And there are signs that that's what he intended to do. What he was intending to do was probably go on pilgrimage, make things right with the church and with God, because he hadn't been necessarily a good boy. And when he got back, he was going to try for a legitimate and prestigious marriage. Is it possible that uh, Robert may have been married to Estrid, uh, Knut's half-sister, for a few months? Something that she didn't want, but uh, was forced into accepting? If so, the union wasn't perfected. So 
Um, and it wasn't accepted by anybody, really. I mean, it wasn't something that, um, first of all, it, it never went anywhere, and then no offspring uh, resulted. Um, and so uh, a marriage that didn't result in offspring uh, might as well not have happened. Uh, so you just end up with William when the word comes back uh, from the pilgrimage that Robert is dead. Uh, William is, is all they have of Robert. You have other people who are members of the ducal family who might want to be duke, but, but uh, Robert, uh, Robert's will actually is respected to the extent that, uh, that William is made, is made duke. He's the, the main figure indelibly associated with the uh, 11th century history of Normandy as well as England. A man that uh, everybody knows thanks to the epithet, uh, the conqueror. His contemporaries, however, never call him that. To them, he was uh, either William Nothus or Bastardus. So, who is this personage uh, born sometime between September 1027 and September 1028? And how much do we know about his, uh, his first years? We don't know very much about his earliest years. Uh, we know a little bit about his mother. So his mother was, uh, in the English pronunciation, her Leva, the daughter of Fulbert, who was probably uh, Duke, Rich, uh, Duke Robert's chamberlain. Uh, so what that means is that she was not from a very high status family, but also not from a very low status family either. So she would have been from a middling rank uh, in terms of her family background, somebody who would not have been a wife material for the Duke of Normandy, uh, but also not a casual liaison. Uh, there's a much later story that she actually made him uh, walk, go into the castle on a horse publicly respected as his official concubine. We don't know if that really happened, but basically she was apparently able to, if not make him put a ring on it, uh, it wasn't that, uh, she was able to get him to give her some sort of official uh, recognition. And then when the liaison had taken its course, shall we say, uh, she was provided with an appropriate marriage. So uh, she married one of uh, the king's close associates uh, and had children who then became the half-siblings of the later William the Conqueror. And he did very well by those siblings. So he was very close to them. He was close to his mother and to his mother's other children, his half-siblings. Uh, so she was clearly an important force um, in his early life. William also had a, a sister in the person of Adele, you know, Adeliza. We don't hear as much about uh, female children. The perennial problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, right? Um, what we do hear more about are his two half-brothers. So Robert Count of Mortain and Odo, um, Bishop of Bayeux, um, and later Earl of Kent. Right? So uh, he had a, 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 a habit, William did, of really taking care of the people that he had been close to in his early years. So the children of the people who supported him in his difficult early minority as Duke, uh, he often gave a lot of attention to and a lot of land to later on when, uh, when he conquered England. So he was, to that extent, a very loyal lord. And surely that helped in terms of recruiting people to follow him. He had that reputation of being somebody it was worth following. People tend to, to focus on the fact that he was the bastard son of the Duke of Normandy, that his mother was just a commoner. But is it possible to, to draw a parallel between um, English monarchs like Harold Harefoot or Harthacnut and William of Falaise in, in terms of, let's say, legitimacy of rulership? Very much so. And here I'll go back to what I said earlier about the fact that ideas of legitimacy were very much in flux in this period. So nowadays, if you think of the English royal family, 
the rules of succession are very strict. Everybody knows who is supposed to succeed the current monarch. Uh, Wikipedia has 60 free places of who's going to come next. Somebody has actually worked out that there are 4,192 people in the line of succession <laughs> until you come to a genealogical dead end. Right. It does not work that way in the 11th century. Yeah. Uh, because they, they don't care <laughs> sure. about rules like that. They have a lot more pragmatic things to think about. Uh, so legitimacy is one thing, but power is another. And this is perfectly illustrated in the succession dispute that happened in England in 1035. So very much exactly the same period when uh, young Duke William is taking uh, office. So 1035, the king of England, the Danish born king Knut dies and leaves really a mess of a succession issue because he has children by two different women, one of whom uh, is English. She was an English noblewoman, um, Alfifu of Northampton. He was probably not married in the eyes of the church to her, but may have been married in what the sources say is the Danish fashion, uh, more donico, uh, which is some, some sort of uh, union that would have been more recognized in the Scandinavian world. It may have not have been, you know, unions had different levels of legitimacy. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, I'd say that this was the common type of union in the first years of the county slash uh, duchy. The early dukes of Normandy were married in this fashion. So it is, uh, the, the church at this point is trying to, make a distinction. You're married or you're not married. Lay society doesn't really completely see it that way. So you have Knut has this one woman, but then he contracts this very official church sanctioned union with Emma of Normandy. And this is obviously a ploy for a couple of things. One, there's continuity in England because Emma of Normandy had been the wife of um, Athelred the previous king of England. And so if you marry the queen, well, you're changing the king, but the queen's the same, you know, maybe, maybe we've got a little continuity there, but it was also a way of conciliating Normandy. So Normandy was going to be okay with Knut's rule in England. If a Norman princess, essentially a Norman noblewoman was on the throne beside him. So he's got two women and they each have sons. And in 1035, it's really not clear who is going to succeed. Um, Knut has not left explicit instructions about this because he dies unexpectedly. I mean, he wasn't on his deathbed or anything. It's a sudden illness and off he goes. Um, and then you've got uh, a fraught situation because one of his sons is in Norway. One of them is in Denmark, keeping an eye on the other parts of the huge Scandinavian empire that Knut uh, ruled, and then one is in England. And unsurprisingly, if we think about it in the end, the one who's in England ends up as king. And this uh, story will be repeated in 1066 when the one who's in England ends up as king in January of 1066. So the, the debate over who is going to be king, though, doesn't end. Uh, you have a slanging match between the partisans of Harold Harefoot, who does um, King, the son of Alfie of you of Northampton, um, and, and um, Harold uh, Hartha Knut, the son by Emma. And one of the the, uh, the weapons in the rhetorical arsenal that the partisans of Hartha Knut uh, aim at Harold Harefoot is not that he's illegitimate. That's what we would expect. We would expect them to say, hey, you're the son of the unofficial union. That's Game over, right? No, that wouldn't have been game over by itself. Okay. What they say is that he's not actually Knut's son at all. That, you know, no one ever, never saw them together. You know, that it's Knut, uh, this, yeah, it's okay. So yeah, he had a relationship with her, but this is not, this is not uh, her son by Knut. It's her son by a low-born Englishman, by a commoner. 
and not even just a commoner, like a, a tradesman or something, right? So what they're saying is essentially they're conceding the fact that if um, Harold Harefoot really had been Knut's son, he would have been in the running to be king. So you don't have an automatic disqualification on the grounds of the marital status of the parents. So it's very similar, I think, to what's going on in Normandy, where you could absolutely become king or duke as somebody whose parents weren't totally 100% officially married. This changes after that, though. And by the 12th century, it's a no-go. You have a very analogous situation in 1135 in England, when Henry I dies with no legitimate sons, he has a very plausible illegitimate son, Robert of Gloucester, who was ready on day one to be king. He would have made a great king, I think, Robert of Gloucester. But illegitimate, and that's it. You know, he, he just had no shot at it. He didn't even make a go of it. And instead, he backed the case of his sister. So by that point, it was a better bet to back the claim of a woman over an illegitimate son, which in 1035 would have been inconceivable. You would have never thought of it that way. So one might say that in the 11th century, the key word was continuity, and that on both sides of the, uh, the English Channel, with the difference being that in England, those around the king worried about continuity, whereas in Normandy, the, the duke himself had to, to turn it into a priority in case anything at all happened to him while on, uh, on pilgrimage. He had to make sure that uh, everyone would recognize William as his legitimate heir. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing to keep in mind, too, is that the, the king or the duke or whoever can express their will before death. And it was important. you know. And as we'll see when we get to 1066, it, it does count for quite a bit. But after that, a lot of things happen and uh, power politics can take over. And the most important thing really is competence. You can't have an incompetent king. Uh, this is why actually minorities were relatively rare in this period. Uh, the sign of a, of a, of a, a country that is becoming uh, more bureaucratized is that they are successfully able to negotiate royal minorities without batting an eye. In this period, it was something that you tried to avoid if you possibly could. And let's face it, young William did not have an easy time of it. And it wasn't the first time in the, uh, the short history of Normandy uh, at that point, uh, because uh, William's son, Richard I, was only, I don't know, 10, 12 years of age when his father died quite violently, and uh, he had no choice but to, to take the reins of the, the county. Yeah. Now, people did grow up fast in this period. Uh, they were paying attention from an early age. There was no, there was no sheltering of children um, in this period. It's, it's wrong to say there were no childhoods in the Middle Ages. That's a historical uh, fallacy that has long been uh, disproved, but by the same token, they weren't really sheltered. They did know what was going on, and you know, William had a close personal uh, advisor murdered under the same roof when he was a young child. Um, many close advisors either were assassinated or came very close to being assassinated, so he was quite familiar with violence on an intimate scale um, in his early years. And he escaped numerous assassination attempts. So he came up in what we would think of as the school of hard knocks. Uh, he was very aware of how contingent his existence really was and how important it was to make sure that he kept order in the duchy because his life depended on it. 